joining for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is the wonderful Lee Welter. Hi. We have and we have Jason McPhee from the Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. And gentlemen, today we're going to hear to talk about this the topic I came across this week was an elite was a, a concept we call an elite. No, I can't speak today. Elite panic. Elite it's panic. A... I'm panicky over here. With oh, no. voice. I'm panicky over here, and I forgot the can't say the word panic. This is strange. But there's this concept called elite panic, and what it is is that the elites have a you know an issue come up like COVID or anything else, a war, or whatever, or aliens. You know, pick, take your pick. At, and the elites say, oh, the the uh, people at large are going to panic, so we are going to make response based upon our belief that the people will panic, rather than the actual belief is, hey, let's actually tell the people what's going on so they don't panic, right? You know, be on, open and honest so people don't panic. The or tell say, them what's not going on. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, what they do is they lie, they manufacture, because they're so afraid of the average person panicking that they panic, mm -hmm. that they're the ones who actually end up panicking, and the average people has, has shown time and time again over the course of history, that average people actually don't panic, at least in mass. I mean, you get someplace like, you know, Hurricane Katrina, you saw the panic and some looting, but the reality is most people didn't. No, not only that, but it was private enterprise who stepped in, uh, I forget if it was Walmart or some other company, delivered water when people needed it. In addition, there was a pre-existing plan to evacuate people using school buses. Those school buses sat idle during the whole time, and uh, they would have been used to ferry people to hotels where they could go up to the third or the fourth floor and stay out of the water. As usual, the planners' plans always uh, uh, leave us leave us wanting. <laughs> well, that's maybe the concept. Maybe you know they're so afraid that they will panic that they assume everybody else is going to yeah. panic. And you know what we saw in, in Hurricane Katrina. What happened was the first, the um, first rescuers weren't weren't emergency responders. They were average people getting in their boats and makeshift craft to go Impressive. rescue people. And mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that's the thing we need to focus on. But the, what the planners see is they see you know the the one store that got looted. You know the one neighborhood that went not. They didn't see the whole rest of the of the community that actually worked to you know help each other. And that's what actually what happens when we have these. Uh, things like COVID, actually most people came and helped each other. At first, the first you know month, everybody got together. No one knew what was going on. Everybody was, was kind of afraid. Everybody kind of got together. And then as more information came on, we, you know, more and more people got to see, you know, these people are panicking and we don't know why. And you know, the responses to it, as we said, you know, the COVID response, this new variant, as it's actually a good example, if you take in China, has this new COVID variant, has Shanghai, 26 million people locked down, and the variant appears to be very less deadly than even Omicron was. And so we've got 26 million people locked down. I saw a clip yesterday in, uh, of Shanghai where people were hanging outside their balconies screaming for food, and you have a drone <laughs> coming in telling them to go back inside. And, you know, and, and what is, I forget the phrase they used because it was in Chinese, and so you never know because you get the interpretation. Well, you give it a try. You get the interpretation. <laughs> But it was essentially it's like, you know, arrest your, your desire for freedom and go back inside and be safe. Well, they're hungry. <laughs> you know, it's not freedom that they want, it's food. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, people are often willing to sacrifice one for the other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, the sense I get too is that uh, a lot of people, uh, if they truly understood who their planners were, they would panic much more <laughs> than their planners are panicking. <laughs> Yeah, and and so as we see in China, or we see even still here in California, where or, or other places where you still have to wear masks in places that don't make sense. You still have some schools where they're actually making children wear masks outside still. Okay. And it's there's this we've reached this point where there's this absurdity. Well, and I see people driving their cars, the only one in the car, and they're wearing a mask. It's it's really bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So, but that cost, that fear that we're living in here is. How did we allow this to get to that point? How did we allow ourselves to get to the point where we are so afraid of air, essentially, that we drive around in our car with masks? And I don't, you know, I don't want to pick on any particular person because, you know, we all have, you know, I have an anxiety disorder myself, right? And so, you know, different things affect me differently. And so if someone has an anxiety disorder and they're more comfortable wearing a mask, more power to them, right? Absolutely. It's, it's when the, 
the powers that be try to manipulate people, try to use fear and, and coercion and punishment to get people to wear masks is where the problem comes in, right? It, become, it creates a moral dilemma, a moral hazard. And, and so how do we deal with that, Jay? I, I, I think part of the problem is, you know, it's that sort of elite tie between the Hollywood elites, government, and all that. Uh, you know, I think a lot of these people have just, they, they've been watching so much drama, so many, uh, you know, zombie films Average and everything. Drama, right? Exactly. And so now this is our chance to have the drama happen for real. And of course, if you're in the planning position, then, then uh, you know, maybe you want to launch into action. And, uh, you know, just all the incentives are wrong, but that's the way it usually is with government. So. Yeah. All the wrong incentives. And the problem is you have wrong incentives, you end up with, with terrible outcomes, right? We have the government telling us they're doing this, they do all this to try and help people. But as we found out now, the per people they hurt worst, the most, was the poor. The people who are the most vulnerable, the people who have to actually go out, who can't stay home, and the people who have to go out and continue to work. You know, they were called unessential workers and were sent home. And, and now we've got people who can't, who have, are behind on their rent, the, their, their Credit card bills are are, tack, are you know stacked up, yes. and all this is it's not their fault. They didn't. They're not the ones who asked to have their economies no. interrupted. They're not the ones who asked to have all this, you know, all these slow, various. Slow Joe is acted to protect people from paying rent. What is he protecting the landlords as well? How does that work? <laughs> There's a big chain, uh, supply and demand, and uh... well, that that's the problem too. A lot of these planners, I mean, they just. I mean, this, this is the, the problem, uh, the, the, the sort of economic problem of central planning, and it's that there's just not enough information for people trying to make decisions for everybody else. So you can't possibly hope. I mean, just imagine Santa Claus with his long list trying to figure out for every <laughs> little boy and girl exactly what they want. I mean, that's what the market does with every single transaction. It's trying to uh, sort out these things. But these central planners, they're, they're making these decisions for people that a lot of times they really don't know that much about them. They don't live like them. And of course it's going to leave them behind because they just, they, they, they don't have enough knowledge. Yeah, they, they create these plans that then they don't pay attention to what the after effects are, even though us here on this show and you on yours, so we, we told them what was going to happen. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know, you go back two years ago onto Libertarian Counterpoint, and we, we predicted all that. We predicted the inflation. We predicted the the psycho, you know, the psychological devastation. We we predicted, you know, the uh, economic devastation. We predicted that the poor were going to be hurt. We predicted that the education system was going to was going to start falling apart. We predicted all this stuff. It wasn't actually hard to predict. It's not like it was. <laughs> it's not like it's something that couldn't be done. But it's hard for people like Slow Joe Biden. <laughs> but he has advisors that. Are one of them was a former community agitator in Chicago, and yeah. doesn't help. Yeah, so it's, so what, you know, it's, uh, so what do we do when it comes to reeling in our, uh, our politicians, reeling in these state, state uh, central planners, so to speak? You know, how do we actually, how do we start that, Lee? Well, I have my hypothesis, which may or may not be valid, but, uh, we're, we've been saddled with what I call a government monopoly K-12 schooling system, yeah. whether you call it education or indoctrination. It's hard to tell the difference. I once volunteered at a at-risk school classroom and noticed that the adjoining classroom had a window, had a sign in the window that said, fairness is not what, when people get what they want. It's when they get what they need. And I thought, no, it's when they get what they earn. There's a huge difference. And people are going to sit back and let government steal from other people for them. Pretty soon they're stealing on their own and cutting out the middleman, right? Oh, yes. And thinking it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, you, know, you know, I think on the short term, the best we can do is try and show the hypocrisy of the elites. And, and we've done that a lot with people like, uh, Gavin Newsom and others, you know, with the idea that they're sitting there locking people down and that yet they're out hobnobbing at the nicest places, not wearing masks while they're telling everybody else to wear masks. 
But it, that, that only goes so far because once you show the hypocrisy, you've got to also hand them another path. And I, I mean, I think you're right on, Lee, with the fact that it makes it so hard to show people the other path when they've been indoctrinated already in public education, uh, that government is the solution to every problem. I, I think we, we need to show people the power of markets. But they talk a good game. Yeah. They sure do. That's their that's their strength. Well, maybe that's actually one of the good things about the elite panicking, right? They panic so much that the education system has essentially now failed, yeah. right? It's collapsed in upon itself. And so people are starting to realize that, hey, this education system isn't what we thought it was. You know, it's not the, it's not the we're here for you thing. It's you're here for us thing, right? We can actually now see that the education system is completely turned on its head, that and so maybe that's actually a good thing. Maybe that's where it starts because, you know, you were, we saw the people complaining about, you know, parents showing up at school boards and getting all angry. But that's the job of parents to show up at school boards. Absolutely. You know? and, and there's a there was an interesting model uh, some decade or so ago called the Washington, D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, whereby the fortunate students or the families that had winning lottery tickets, so to speak, got to send their youngsters to private schools with a voucher to cover the cost. Well, the Washington, D.C. public school system has a graduation rate of approximately 50%. It's not really good. Those who got the opportunity scholarships had a graduation rate of more than 90%. That's a vast improvement. And must be recognized, the families that requested or sought the voucher and did not get it still had children with a 70% pass rate, which shows you the family motivation is a part of the picture. But unfortunately, uh, the president at the time got a message from his um, puppet masters and tried to do, felt obligated to wind the program down. It's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and uh, just uh, for any of our listeners who want to find out more, uh, they made a documentary, I think, that covers some of what you were talking about called Waiting for Superman. And so oh, that's yes. an excellent documentary if you want to. In fact, I think the guy who made it was even a Democrat, which kind of ruffled some feathers. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, essentially the point was is that, you know, we can't just sit around waiting for Superman. We've got to take this bull by the horns and fix it ourselves. And one of our solutions, you know, the libertarian solution to uh, the education problem is school choice, right? Is you have small individual schools that, that I, we like to use the word compete, but that's actually kind of, well, I think. Free in markets. Is actually Let the, the wrong word. Let the customers decide. It's like, I think the compete is actually the wrong word. It's we, we believe in giving various flavors of education for those who have various needs, who have various needs, right? So people with anxiety disorders need to be in a smaller educational environment, you know, People, normal people, you know, normal people like my son, he's a normal, he can perfectly fine in a 1,500, 2,000 school, person school, in high school. My, my daughter, she struggled with that. And so she would have been better off in a smaller school. And so, you know, and some people, I had a, a stepdaughter type unit. She went to a, a medical high school, a high school that taught medical. Oh, that's fantastic. And, you know, and now she didn't use it after she got out of school, but it motivated her, helped her. It was interesting, and so it helped keep her involved in the educational process. It wasn't just, you know, the routine, normal, boring school. Yes. And so, so we give these kids different flavors. We give them something they're interested in. If you, I said, you can teach so much math with baseball, right? You, you can teach high math. If you have a kid who's interested in baseball, you can actually teach them high algebra, geometry, all kinds of stuff by using something he's actually interested in rather than have him sit in a classroom just looking at charts and, <laughs> you know. Well, but you know, this is one of the things that uh, I, I find so off-putting about the central planners and the people who have such faith in government is that, uh, you know, the, the, the liberty position is really the position of humility, the one that says, you know, we really don't know what's best for you, you and you. We want we you to look for that yourself. And that competition will help other people to get the right signals, too, on what might work for them. But if you have competition, you're not likely to get equality. <laughs> That's ironic. I noticed during this uh, uh, NCAA basketball tournament, 
one of the basketball courts had a sign that says equality. I says, oh, you, you, you settle for nothing less than a tie score? Is that what you mean? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, equality on a basketball court. That is kind of, but that is kind of strange, isn't it? There's no, there's no such thing as equality on a basketball court, right? It, it's that's not how it is. Everybody's different, yeah. you know. Even two point guards it can be the same height, yeah. it, but they're they're vastly different in how they approach the game. Equality doesn't exist. But Jason talked about humility just a minute ago. And one of the things as economists, you know, were so wrong about our current economic situation. They didn't think printing all that money was going to cause inflation. They thought inflation was transitory. They, they said, oh, it's fine. You know, it's all short term. But yet now that we've, oh, well, now we're headed toward a recession as we now as we approach the, the show tonight, today, I said, all the signs are pointing. Red flags are inflate, inflation is here. A recession is coming. But we're not going to hear any apologies from those economists who two years ago said, no, nah, it's fine, who a year ago said, ah, it's transitory. They're well, not going to come out here and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong, are they? Prominent economist, if you can call him that, Paul Krugman, decided to become a, a propagandist instead of a real economist. And he seemed to be telling us we can spend our way into prosperity at the same time we're borrowing our way out of debt. <laughs> well, oddly enough, I found out that his, his book was actually ghostwritten. So even his book wasn't actually written by him. So, you know, his, some other economist wrote his book, not him. He just put his name to it so they could sell copies. And so, you know, but where is the humility of our, even if they're not central planners of these so-called experts who come out here, they make these proclamations that this is how it is. No, it's fine. You know, and average people like us guys, you people are crazy. <laughs> you know, we can sit there and look at, you know, the economic situation and no, you print six trillion dollars in a short period of time while restricting economic activity, you have nothing but inflation. There, it's yeah. just, there's, it's yeah. gonna I, come. Even, <laughs> that, even that, that term grates on me. They talk about inflation as if it's something like a meteor that's going to strike the earth sometime. It's called currency devaluation. Every trillion dollars you've Print means that every dollar that pre-existed and the assets have lesser value. Yeah, I, b Back. I believe they, they said that the money supply, I, mean, I can't remember if it was M2 or whichever one they said, but increased by like 40-something percent in the last year or two, I think, or the last yeah, it was years. An, it's, you know, yeah. it's insane. You can understand you need to print, you know, as the economy grows, you need to print more money, so, it, so money's floating around. That understands, but it's, oh, well, we're just going to print a ridiculous amount of money so we can give it to... Who? Because remember, it's not like the government actually prints the money, right? It's the Fed prints the money, then they go lend it out to banks, and then the banks borrow, go give it to the government, and, you know, borrow, buy bonds and whatever to get it to the government. So it's not like the government is actually printing money. 1913 was a terrible year. Woodrow Wilson was the president, and they put through the income tax and founded the Federal Reserve System such evil that people don't understand it. It's just, except it's like the, the fish will be in a polluted river. It's all the same water to them. Yeah, and, and they act like, okay, well now we're gonna raise interest rates to try to fight inflation. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that lever's broken already. <laughs> I mean, we've, sat, <laughs> we've sat at absurdly low interest rates for so long. The, you know, while, while they should have been paying back debt at that point, instead yeah. they've been increasing debt, which means that y y you're essentially, you raise those interest rates, you're going to raise back the, the price that they have to pay back all that debt with. But, which but is, we can't have those college uh, students uh, defaulting on their loans. We have to pay them off for them. Free stuff, free this, free that. It's Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> your, your professors, in fact, uh, uh, at the Mises.org, there's a... Um, an article called The Anti-Capitalistic uh, Mentality in which uh, Mises wrote that the professors love the protection of being in the university because, because their talents wouldn't bring very much in the free market, but they name their own price almost. And the, this, uh, well, the manipulated market of our university system, right? It's not a free, the, the university system is no longer a free market when you have government money coming in That's right. know, and government loan guarantees coming in. Stolen money. And the, the other side of that is in, in, a normal, in a normal market, you know, 
you have bankruptcy. So there's a moral hazard to lending all these people money. But there's no yeah. bankruptcy to student loans. The students can't go, hey, you know, I got screwed over by my, uh, by my university. They gave me this worthless education. I can't, I have no chance of paying these things back. I'm going to go to court and get at least some of it wiped away, right? Like you do with regular debt. Yeah. You can't do that with student loan debt. Well, you know, as we've been talking, I think I had an epiphany of what the Democrats can do with Biden at this point. He wants to give stuff to everybody. Uh, you know, as we come up on Christmas, he could just leave his job and become a mall Santa Claus. <laughs> and people could come in there, tell him what he wants, and he can just make up all kinds of promises that he doesn't have to fulfill. <laughs> Well, and you know he gets to smell some hair as uh, as this as the yeah, as, as <laughs> <laughs> smell a little bit. And, <laughs> and what about VP Harris? I mean, she she sort of established herself in one sort of career, but I don't know if it's the same or not. It brings to mind uh, P. J. O'Rourke's book. Do you remember the title of that? No, I do not. It's titled "A Parliament of Whores." Uh, yeah. Well, you know, these, they do sell themselves. You know, these politicians these days, they, okay. they do sell themselves. Uh, so that, that it's, unfortunately, it's a very, yes. It's a, very good, uh, it's a very good analogy. But, you know, our schools have also, this panic among our, our elites have also caused our schools to become surveillance states, right? Our <sighs> schools are no longer just there to educate our children. They're there to watch our children. They're there to watch how we raise our children. They're there to try to dictate to us how we raise our children. And, and that's, I don't take that in a positive way. In fact, I read an article about uh, what killed um, our, our, our meadow. Was the, the name of a girl killed in that um, Florida school shooting? Mm -hmm. And it talks about there were all the warning signs for some of the students. They said, oh, no, no, you can't. These delinquent, I mean, these misbehaving children, you shouldn't punish them. It'll just make them worse. You should build up their self-esteem and tell them that they're loved, no matter how evil they are. Well, if, if children are misbehaving, it might be because they're in the wrong educational environment. Very possibly, <laughs> yes. You know? And so instead of forcing them into a wrong educational environment where you're creating psychological problems, is you get them in a in a educational environment that's suited to them. And so if we force people into environments that are, they're ill-suited for, we're going to cause, you know, psychological problems. Yeah. Well, not, not to mention that, but I mean, if you look at all of the damage that COVID has done to all these kids' plans, all the milestones they would have had that they've had to put on the shelf and, and just miss, you know, I, I, I just can't imagine if you are somebody who's finishing school right now and you're, you know, all of the uh, things, all of the stuff that government has thrown in your way as a as a young person and uh you know you are one of the people least at risk from this whole thing and yet you know you're you're really saddled with all of the costs going into the future i just uh, you know you, the, the the debt that they built up all that stuff it's and and it's not just the cost of now that we're teaching kids to accept surveillance you know these kids that we're, we're watching a, the mental health breakdown of our, of our children, right? We're seeing our, our teachers are experiencing that our kids are now misbehaving more than ever in schools. And the sad thing is there's always been a certain suicide rate among teenagers. Being a teenager's got to be a tough role. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I did some crazy things when I was young. I'd just rather not think about them anymore. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's a troubling time in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the suicide rates are, sky are skyrocketing. The, the suicide attempts are skyrocketing. The mental health, you know, 19% before COVID, 19% of people had an anxiety disorder. That's 19% of the people in the United States. But the adults. upside is that now some people are starting to address that problem and to minimize its impact. Yeah, yeah but According the problem, to one article I read. Yeah, but the problem is, Lee, they created the problem. You know, our education system and then now our response to COVID actually created the problem. Yeah. And now they're going to come back and, and pretend to solve the problem. They're going to pat themselves on the back. But how much money we're spending to solve this problem that we've created? Well, the, their solution may be to hand some kid a bunch of sex hormones, <laughs> too. <laughs> Tell them that this is your problem. <laughs> just create a whole new series of problems. <laughs> okay. All right. We are just about done, so I want to thank everybody. Well, we got no. a few minutes. A few minutes? Uh, six minutes. Yeah, you have to look at both hands. Uh, six, hey, I am, you know, some of us don't, still don't see very well, Lee. You're um, adding like a politician here. <laughs> you, you brought to mind a really interesting book, and I believe the title is The Teacher Leadership Handbook. 
and it talks about a special schooling system that was very successful. They would ask the students, what interests you? What would you like to learn? And one of their first students said, I'm interested in blacksmithing. So they found that 40, 40 miles away, there was a blacksmith who was willing to take on an extern and work with them and learn the trade. I think that's terrific. And uh, let the student sort of lead the way in terms of their interest and well, once you made a world of difference. Because once you find an interest, then you can you can squeeze all kinds of things into Absolutely. that interest. Absolutely, you yes. can you can you know you blacksmith. Well, you want to learn how to blacksmith. Well, you you need you need to learn how to read so you can actually you know so you can actually know the proper materials to use. Yes, and so you can say, well, here you got to learn this, and so they're going to have to learn how to read. You don't have to teach tell them that they're learning how to read, but they're going to have to learn how to read to do it. They're going to have to learn math in order to to do it because they have to get the formula right for the for, to get their steels. To get the steel mixture right, you know, yes. how hot do you need to to and, have the the kiln going? You know, all yeah. these various. And, and sometimes having the right attitude makes a world of difference. I have a grandson who is very safety conscious. He was working uh, alongside his father um, on some old pipes, with a fire sprinkler system, and he said, "Dad, you should put your safety goggles on." Yeah, all right, all right, put his safety goggles on. A couple minutes later, he's trying to loosen a pipe connection with a really aged steel pipe. It shattered, and one piece hit the glass, destroyed the glasses, but not his vision. I thought, you're on the right track. And he later was at the top of his class in a community college learning to be a welder. And he said, there's a lot of welding gear you can wear to face protection and the bright light. You don't want to blind yourself with the, all the radiation. He said, but the students don't realize that radiation can cause problems, can cause skin cancer and what have you, and the fumes can, well, anyway. He, he knows more than I do about it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's inspirational. Yeah, and well, anytime you can get someone to actually learn something that anytime someone's learning something they're interested in they're more involved in it right i mean just pick any take your life right you're now an engineer and you know you when you found that i think we've told talked to the story about you weren't a good student in, until you at some point you became oh yeah you yeah found the a motivation public right? schools gosh k, k through 12 i by the time i was in uh <laughs> gosh 10th grade or so i was practically uh, out of school more than I was in school, but, <laughs> but it was actually the, the, the community college system and getting into that that uh, later on sort of redirected me back into the uh, uh, into a positive path. But a lot of that was because of the attitude. I mean, when you see, when you go to K through 12, uh, well, or uh, high school rather, a lot of it is babysitting. But um, once you get over to the community college, people are there because they want to be there. It's not like they're there because they have to be there. They're not being parked there. So... Attitude. <laughs> and we hear our music. We hear the music coming, so we want to thank you everybody for watching. We want to thank you guys for being here with us. We want thank to thank you. Access Sacramento pleasure. for being here and being the bastion of free speech that they have been in this time where B -A -S -T -I -O -N. free speech is, Yeah. Where, <laughs> where the free speech is a, a rare thing these days. And so thank you guys for coming and thank you for watching and have a good night. Thank you.